welcome to all of you who are joining us for this liturgy symposium, both in person here at the ISM and also online via the live stream. The Yale ISM, where we are able to gather in person once again, is an interdisciplinary graduate center for the study and practice of sacred music, worship, and the arts. And we are located on the traditional land of the first peoples of what is now the state of Connecticut in the Quinnipiac watershed. My name is Teresa Berger. I coordinate the liturgical studies program here at the ISM, and I also teach liturgical studies at YDS. And it's my privilege to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Ephraim Ishak who in many ways needs no introduction at the ISM, but it's a wonderful ritual to introduce someone, even if that person is known here. Uh, Dr. Ishak has been with us since the fall. Some of you are in a class he's teaching this semester. He was also here as a short-term fellow in 2020, if I remember correctly, just days before everything shut down because of COVID. So, he's a well-known scholar of Syriac liturgy, a liturgical tradition that is also his ecclesial home. He grew up in Aleppo, Syria, and obtained a doctorate in liturgical studies from the Holy Spirit University of Kaslik in Lebanon. He also holds an MA from St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary down the road I think in that direction, and a BA in English Literature from the University of Aleppo. Before coming to the ISM, he was a researcher at the University of Graz in Austria, at the Vestigia Manuscript Research Center. He has taught Syriac language and liturgy at the University of Salzburg and at the Central European University in Vienna. Much more could be said about his research, his publications, his many presentations, but I want to take just a moment to acknowledge the Fried, um, last Friday's workshop that uh, Professor Ishak um, organized praying with uh, tears on uh, that particular practice in Eastern Christian uh, traditions. It was uh, simply fascinating and it brought back um, a previous ISM fellow from some years ago, Professor Bert Brun, specialist in Eastern Byzantine liturgy. So welcome back to the ISM, uh, Bert. Today, uh, Dr. Ephraim Ishak will speak to us on commenting on commentaries of the Syriac liturgy. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. to hate me for that. But I should acknowledge our beloved professor emeritus of liturgy, Brian Spinks, who is joining us for this symposium. My apologies for putting you on the spot. I had to. The spirit made me do it. <laughs> Thank you so much, dear Professor Teresa Berger, for your very kind words of introducing me. I would like also to express my sincere acknowledgement to the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. I'm very grateful for uh, everybody working here at ISM, especially at the faculty of the liturgical studies for their kind invitation to give me this honor uh, to give the lecture of this prestigious biannual liturgy symposium lecture. I thank especially dear uh, Professor Emeritus Brian Spinks and Professor Teresa Berger again from the Liturgical Studies and Professor Melanie Ross. Indeed, I'm honored to be this year uh, as a research fellow in this wonderful community, uh, thanks to the ISM director, Professor Martin Jean, and to the assistant director, Dr. Eben Graves, and to everyone uh, here. And perhaps if I will mention every name, uh, it will be a long list. Thank you so much. I would like also to thank uh, everyone here who is gathering today 
at the Miller Hall who came specially during this busy uh, period of the Yale spring semester to support me. And uh, thanks especially for Professor Basilius Berto Grun, who came from Austria and uh, wanted to stay to listen to me for this uh, lecture. Uh, I thank uh, everyone and also for those who are watching us online uh, on the live stream. Thank you all so much. Hannah, my daughter, a seven-year-old who is living in the Austrian city of Graz, was born in a Syriac Coptic family. She has been learning how to pray with her father, the Lord's Prayer, and other short hymns in Syriac Aramaic language. In addition to the Coptic liturgical prayers that she is learning at the Coptic Church, which is the only Oriental Orthodox Church in the Austrian city of Graz. She has been showing recently a remarkable interest in attending the liturgies at the Coptic Church. So she is insisting for attending the liturgy every Sunday and sometimes on Saturdays as well, even though this would complicate sometimes the weekend activities for the family. I asked her once, Hannah, why do you like going to the liturgy? She answered confidently, because I love it. Then, while preparing for this lecture, working on several texts of liturgical commentaries, I asked her, Hannah, would you like to learn about the meanings of why the priest is doing this and that during the liturgy? Hannah replied, well, that would be great. So I added for further clarifications. Then, if you will learn about these meanings, will you love the church more? She said, maybe. Perhaps, Dad, I go to the church for attending the liturgy because I love it. But why I'm sharing this personal story from my family with you today? In fact, Hannah's interesting answers could help me to think again about the liturgical commentaries, especially in the Syriac tradition, which is my focus in this lecture today. How would these commentaries be helpful for the simple or the common, or the average, or the innocent believers like Hannah. In fact, these simple believers have been forming the majority in the church communities. On the other hand, liturgical commentaries were written by bishops, priests, learned scholars, and other people who were capable at least to read and write, so they could belong to somehow to the elites in the society. Although for my academic research, I have been investigating the Syriac liturgical commentaries in manuscripts and fragments, nevertheless, and after thinking deeply in Hannah's answers, I started to look at the concept of commenting on the Syriac liturgy from a different angle. That could pay my attention to other kinds of means which have been functioning as a practical tools to explain and interpret the liturgy. I call these means non-textual liturgical commentaries, which could function as pedagogic tools to explain the liturgy through the church sacred art and the church sacred music. The latter especially, I am happy to recognize while being privileged to be here at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. As you could notice, the title of my lecture, Commenting on Commentaries in the Syrian Liturgy, is intentional, since the titles of the liturgical commentaries, either in the Syriac or in the Arabic, follow a certain poetic rhyming method. So the titles should sound as a poetry verse. But before we go through the sacred art and the sacred music, let us first investigate the phenomenon of textual sacredness by understanding the Syriac text of the liturgical commentaries, which were written in a sacred language, which is Syriac itself. Syriac, while being the Aramaic dialect for the city of Edessa, successfully played the role of sacred language. Thanks to Christianity, Syriac could become a crossroad between Greek, which was the language of literature, and Hebrew, which was the sacred language for Judaism. Syriac also dialogue between Christianity as the recognized 
Roman religion after Constantine the emperor, which later helped to play a political crossing religion belief at the Roman Persian border. This openness of opportunities to Syriac enabled it to function not only as a language of communication by the intellectual elites in the city of Edessa, which is now the southeast of Turkey, but also to become as the sacred language. Truly, Syriac had functioned as a sacred language for several reasons, but one of them while taking the advantage that Jesus himself had spoken the Aramaic Syriac with his disciples, which includes institutionalizing the celebration of the first liturgy, which he taught to his brother James. That's why the red rubrics preceding the anaphora of James in the Syriac liturgical manuscript state this information, which will add to the necessity of a praying with this anaphora at the first liturgy of consecrating the altar, ordaining a priest, or a celebration by any priest for the first time at a new altar. So let's start with the Syriac textual commentaries on liturgy. Indeed, the Syriac liturgical commentaries are important texts to inform us about the meanings and of the liturgical practices through the symbolical interpretations. Additionally, these commentaries could shape the worship tradition while including some disciplinary observations on how to perform the liturgical celebrations, which contributed, therefore, in fixing the structure of the Syriac liturgical texts and rubrics. In other words, this could lead somehow to seize the diverse practices and help to reach an independent identity for the liturgical rites in the Syriac church that can explain bridging some normative practices which after the 12th century, this Syriac rite could realize somehow its final character. For the sake of legitimizing the authority of these liturgical commentaries, some of these texts were attributed to key Syrian fathers, such as Ephraim the Syrian, Jacob of Serug, Jacob of Edessa, and others. While receiving their canonical presentation, certain liturgical commentaries, such as the text written by Moses Bar Kifa in the 9th century and Bar Salibi in the 12th century, became the most influential texts, which in addition to their inspiration on the Syriac liturgy, they could also contribute in the standardizing process of the Syriac rites. Interestingly enough, these Syriac Orthodox commentaries in their backbone structure and method have depended on the Antiochian commentary written by Theodore of Mopsiestia, whose text became the popular liturgical interpretation for the East Syriac church tradition. One of the remarkable characteristics in the liturgical commentaries is the obvious use for the technical mystagogical concept of rose. Rose is a Persian loan word in Syriac, which means symbols with its specific patristic terminology, used especially by St. Ephraim the Syrian, who expressed theology in poetry as the best method to understand the mystery of salvation in the Bible and in the nature around us. In fact, the Syriac term rozo is peculiar. Although it used to be translated as mystery, but Sebastian Brock, as he suggested, after studying the rich poetic writings of St. Ephraim the Syrian, rozo shall be translated as a symbol. Of course, the modern sense of symbol could be challenging to understand the concept of symbols in the early church fathers. In our common sense, the symbol could be different from what is symbolizing. But for the early patristic understanding, the symbol has an ontological link with what is symbolizing. For St. Ephraim, these rose or symbols are hidden either in the Bible or in the nature around us. And we can only understand the spiritual meanings for these symbols with the inner eye. As the physical eye needs light to see objects, so the inner eye needs the proper faith to see these hidden rosé or symbols. Once the inner eye of the heart 
can see and understand the rosary with the light of faith, then the faith is also increased. So this is the concept of rosary in St. Ephraim's writing. And if we apply this concept of rosé on understanding the symbolic world of liturgy, then the liturgical commentaries have been trying to explain the meanings beyond the visible symbols. Again, to see and understand the meaning beyond the symbols, the light of faith is needed as a condition to understand the mysteries through contemplation in the history of salvation. Living in the actual moment of participating in the liturgy in an eschatological experience is very significant here. In short, the liturgical roso, and as Brian Spinks has summarized its function in the Syriac tradition, seems to suggest an ecclesial symbolic action in the present that recalls past salvific acts and anticipates the future eschaton. But what is the philosophy of the Syriac commentaries? And are there other elements, even non-human examples, could be used to interpret certain ambiguities? Generally speaking, the idea of a commentary is to give an explanation. So in Syriac, the word pushoko, which is used to describe the commentary genre in general, which means an interpretation. This is a common human tendency toward understanding any text, especially the religious text, where the human logical way of thinking is often challenged. So then it is called a mystery, while indicating to a spiritual tool for understanding certain ambiguities. In the Syriac tradition, when humans had some doubts about certain religious practices, especially in a liturgical context, Sometimes animals were employed to embarrass humans' doubts. For example, St. Ephraim the Syrian used the metaphor of how to teach a parrot. Then we could learn of how God is teaching us through symbols, rose. The parrot in a later Syriac father, Mar Isaac of Antioch, has used the parrot example, but this time the parrot himself is a rose, is a symbol and he is able to confess the true faith. Later in the 7th, 8th centuries, Mor Jacob of Edessa, in his work, The Hexameron, or The Six Days of Creation, is also talking about a parrot in Antioch that Isaac has seen, but this time, this hero animal could chant the Trisagion. The Trisagion hymn is Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal. But this parrot was adding the statement, who were crucified for us, have mercy upon us. This latter statement was in fact added by the non-Chalcedonian patriarch Peter the Fuller, which later became the identity marker for the non-Chalcedonians. The parrot in this story could sing this Trisagion hymn correctly to shame the Chalcedonians. But can we also know how were these liturgical commentaries received in the society, especially in late antiquity and early medieval time? And were there other needs to understand the liturgy, especially in the Near East? Historically speaking, the Eucharist and the sacramental life in the period of late antiquity was a significant power in the society. And perhaps, the more powerful than the state control. The rulers could end the life of someone, but the sacramental power could heal, could save, and assure the believer's place in heaven. The sacraments used for healing, even for those who were outside the confession. We know from several historical sources how believers could get communion from a priest who used to belong from other theological confessions. Sometimes we could witness that even non-Christians could come to communion to get the blessings from those who are different from their confession. Later we notice also a certain blessing called Hnana, which literally means in Syriac mercy, made out of the dust collected from the tombs of the saints 
could be also giving for healing, even for non-Christians as to Muslims. As you see in the slides, this is from a manuscript here at the uh, 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 Hartford Seminary Syriac Manuscript Collection, number three, and it is now in the Beinecke Rare Book uh, Manuscript Library. And this is from the Book of Charms used for healing by the East Syriac tradition. And especially the healing process was important to heal from the evil eye. And this healing thing could also uh, uh, go for non-Christians uh, as uh, we read in many sources. Even until nowadays, in some regions in the Middle East, many Muslim women still request the miraculous works at Christian holy shrines and saints' tombs for various purposes, especially for pregnancy and healings. In fact, although Jacob of Edessa's strictness in his liturgical canons, he allowed such practices to be performed for non-Christians, since he believed that the mercy of God has no limits, and these healings would show the glory of God and his miracles even to non-believers. In late antiquity also, all the believers' priority was salvation through the sacramental participation. We shall keep in mind that most of the society had no luxury to select a priest from their confession. In fact, sometimes we read about a priest who would do the services for Christians from other confessions and although Jacob of Edessa prohibited giving communion and other sacraments to Christians for what he used to see as heretic groups, and in this case, they were the Julianists, the Byzantine Chalcedonians, and Nestorians. However, when he was asked if at a certain village a death case happened, and when there were no priests from the other confessional community, is it okay for a Syrian Orthodox priest to do the services for those? In fact, for Jacob of Edessa, the mercy of God toward the creature in general is important. So he allowed and gave the permission to do such service. And as we read in his book, The Hexameron, or The Sixth Day of Creation, where he saw that the whole world is glorifying God, and the Orthodox believers have the responsibility to make the glory of God on behalf of all the creation. In one of Jacob's answers, to a question addressed to him by a certain priest named Adai, when some people prevented wild animals to eat from the harvest, Jacob highly criticized such people and accused them that they have been obedient to demons who would prevent the creation of God from eating what God has provided them for their food. This can confirm Teresa Berger's words. One might say, in fact, that a diversity of cosmovisions were inscribed into Christian worship practices from the very beginning. Were there other kind of skills in history that could interpret the Syriac liturgy? In fact, another genre which could function as interpreting the power of liturgy was the spiritual stories. This tool was not only used as weapons to defend the confessional positions for the different churches, but they could also inform the community of the believers about the importance of the sacraments with a simple style, unlike the sophisticated approach that we find in the classical liturgical commentaries. Simple stories about the power of Eucharistic elements, such as the Holy Communion, were easier to learn and faster to transmit. Some examples can be given here, such as the stylites monk who threw the Eucharistic communion of the heretics into the fire which was burned, while the Orthodox communion remained without being burned. A similar story to distinguish the power of the communion was to put it inside a pot of boiling water, and the heretical communion will disappear while the true communion will remain as it is. Fire was also used to test the true Christian faith and also to know who is the heretic from who is the really orthodox. So when there was a debate between two monks from the Miaphysite and the Chalcedonian confessions to prove the power of their faith, 
they threw themselves inside the fire and the heretic was burned while the other one remained without any injury. Of course, we have the same story in two versions, depending on who is telling it. The validity of the priest to consecrate the Eucharist was also part of such stories. For example, Anastasius of Sinai, a contemporary to Jacob of Edessa, but from the Chalcedonian Confession, mentioned a story about a priest in the island of Cyprus around the year 640. The priest admitted that he was practicing sorcery. But when he was taken to the court, he told them that during the liturgy, the angels would celebrate the liturgy on behalf of him. Anastasius told many other stories in connection with the Eucharist and the importance of the places where the consecration took place. For example, he mentioned that in Jerusalem, a sorcerer was sitting outside the church of the resurrection. And when he was asked about the reason, he admitted that the demons cannot enter the holy places. Anastasius also once cast out demons from someone and the demons told him that they were afraid of baptism and communion. In fact, even until nowadays, the Syriac churches, and perhaps in the other churches as well, there is a similar tendency to interpret the validity of the Eucharist regardless to the moral defects of some priests. Sometimes the image of fire is used to portray the priest while celebrating the liturgy, or the angels are offering the Eucharist with or on behalf of the priest. The theme of using the angels in such image can be linked easily with the Eucharist, since the angelic theme is very powering in the Syriac anaphoras, especially in the ante sanctus prayers in the anaphora of James, brother of the Lord. Not surprisingly, the West Syriac liturgical commentaries have given specific importance to this angelic theme and image in the liturgy. So after finding how important has been the liturgical life in the society of the Near East in the period of the late antiquity and early medieval times, Let's look at some texts of liturgical commentaries. Several Syriac liturgical commentaries, especially on the Eucharist, were edited and published by scholars such as Sebastian Brock, Baby Varghese, and Kathleen McVeigh. Among the unpublished texts of Syriac liturgical commentaries that I'm working on editing their texts are those written by Ta'azar Barsapta and Daniel Bedbotin from the 9th century, and the Syrian Orthodox commentary by Yahya bin Jarir from the 12th century, written in Arabic. And John of Mardin, also from the 12th century. The manuscript of Sharfe, for one from the 12th century, so somehow contemporary to these uh, uh, commentaries, is an important codex, which includes several commentaries on the Eucharist and the oil of Miron. One of these texts is anonymous without being attributed to any specific name. The commentary insists on mixing the wine with water, while in the old commentary by George, the Bishop of the Arabs in the eighth century, there was a harsh criticism against the Armenian priest who would be mixing the wine with water. The reason for George of the Arabs that Armenians were taught by Jews and Chalcedonians, that's why they are mixing water with wine. In this unpublished commentary, the commentator gives interesting mystagogical interpretation to link between the sacrifice, the behta, and the Eucharist, celebrating the liturgy also on one piece of bread is a symbol on the divinity of the incarnated word. Nevertheless, if the priest will celebrate with two pieces of bread, then it is a reference for the divinity of the word and his humanity. Then the priest shall celebrate only with odd numbers of the pieces of bread, without giving any explanation or any symbolical meaning. So there is no logical 
synthesis for giving the symbolism to each movement. It is simply trying to give meanings for some practices. The commentary gives further instructions and rubrics to warn the priest. The sanctified blood must be drunk immediately after the liturgy, but the consecrated body may be preserved for one week, which is still the current practice for the Syriac tradition to give communion for a sick person or for certain urgency, such as before dying. Also, in this manuscript, there is a treatise written by a certain Daniel. And if Patriarch Afrin Barsom's assumptions is correct, then this could be Daniel Bedbotin from the ninth century, which is an old date. The treatise includes, in addition to the symbolic interpretation of the liturgical elements, it gives also an interpretation on how the transmutation will take place by the priest who will change the bread and wine to the body and the blood of Christ. In the same Sharfe manuscript, we find another commentary written by John of Mardin from the 12th century, which is part of a lengthy commentary on the Mirun oil, in addition to some parts regarding the Eucharistic celebration. The commentator makes a difference between the importance of the liturgical element used in the celebration. For example, if there is no more incense, then the liturgy shall be continued regardless. However, if the Eucharistic elements of the wine and the bread are missing, then the liturgy cannot be offered. The commentary also mentions that the bread must be from pure wheat and the wine has to be from grapes. Moreover, the service should be offered by the priest with a strict seriousness while resembling the angels who are serving God. In fact, it makes a comparison between the priest and the seraphim who did not dare to look at God as we read in the book of Isaiah 6 while the priest is serving with his hand the greatest mystery. The priest shall examine the altar carefully to make sure that nothing is hidden at the Eucharistic table, which can inform us about such a custom, as we know from other sources, where people could hide some gifts inside the altar to be taken afterwards as a blessing to their homes. The priest shall also clean up carefully the covers over the chalice and the pattern, in addition to many other instructions. The priest has to be in hurry while mixing the wine with water. The priest must not add further pieces of bread or more wine as a matter of gluttony. The commentary is also strict that the priest shall clean very well the chalice, the pattern, so no pieces can be left Another textual tool that can function as liturgical commentaries are the canons and the letters correspondence between monks, ecclesiastics, and other church scholars. In fact, part of my argument here is the importance of other components in the Syriac literature which could have functioned also for interpreting the Syriac liturgy, such as the canons. As we see in the case of Mo Jacob of Edessa, his translations of the important canonical collections, such as the eight books of Clement, which include the famous apocryphal document of the Testament of our Lord, or known as Testamentum Domini, in addition to his own canonical letters. They were all cited in the later liturgical commentaries. That's to say the Syriac canons were not separated from the liturgical interpretations which was probably similar to other Christian traditions such as in the West, since we notice a similar tendency with Thomas Aquinas. In the West and the East Syriac tradition for the canonical collection of Synodicon, which is the West Syriac Synodicon and the Synodicon Orientale, we can notice many indirect and direct references about the liturgy. Some of those canons comprise interpretation while explaining the reasons for certain canonical regulations. Although not all of these canons have entered the classical works of Syriac liturgical commentaries, nevertheless, 
liturgical rites for their church communities, they could also function as somehow with a strong relationship with the canons. It should be noted here that the nature of the Syriac synodical acts is different from what is found in the Byzantine and in the Latin churches. For the Syriac synodical acts, it includes also some letters which were composed by a patriarch or a catholicos, that they were the top leaders for the East and West Syriac churches, which later might enter inside the synodical collections of canons. So circulating such letters in the synods could qualify them to receive their synodal validity. In the Syrian Orthodox tradition, we notice in the West Syriac Synodicon around seven synods between the 7th and the 9th century, some of which took place to resolve certain conflicts of the patriarchal authority with rivals. Parts of the arguments touch several liturgical issues, either to explain or to legitimize issuing certain decisions. In the East Syriac Synodicon, we read in several synods some attempts by the Catholicos to explain and clarify several liturgical customs in the Church of the East. And in fact, Maria Shu'yab was treated as the reformer for the East Syriac liturgy. In other words, the canons and the commentaries have been working together to interpret, to discipline, and so to unify the liturgical practices in the Syriac tradition. Therefore, it's necessary while studying the development of the Syriac liturgical rite to study its canonical collections as well. The canons played also a role in standardizing some liturgical practices and prohibiting certain transgressions. For example, from these canons, we can understand that some believers, as I mentioned, used to hide the communion in their walls, in their beds, and other places in their daily life as a blessing. Jacob of Edessa warned the priest and the laity who would dare to do such practices. Also from Jacob's answers to questions sent to him in letters by different priests and monks, some priests used to send the communion to sick people in lettuce and cabbage leaves, which could be eaten with the communion. Jacob's answers entered the canonical collection in the Syrian Orthodox Church. That's why we notice them included in the 8th, 9th century manuscript in Mardin 309 and Mardin 310. Indeed, the canons are very strict about how to act during the liturgy. In fact, the Eucharistic element received, as Tannus says, like radioactive material today receives. There was a lot of strictness. Moreover, natural disasters were interpreted as God's wrath, which needed repentance and the prayers to stop such catastrophes. This interpretation reflects the power of the liturgical life in history. The liturgical manuscripts include prayers to protect the people during the dangerous times of wars and earthquakes. As my dear colleague, Mark Rosen had studied that very carefully and we are looking forward for his forthcoming book. And these kind of earthquakes we have been witnessing these days as it is the case in Syria with the catastrophic situation of suffering from the destructive two earthquakes in addition to the long years of war since 2010. In fact, yesterday there was another uh, little earthquake in the region. Additionally, many lectionaries include readings for these difficult occasions, which were treated as parts of God's wrath, as Jacob of Edessa would describe in his Syriac translation of Testamentum Domini with its apocalyptic and eschatological language. In fact, there are hymns about when there is an earthquake and famine, as we see in the manuscript. But this is not only in history, but even nowadays, similar religious tendencies of interpretations in Christianity and in Islam. They are given that, as we could notice also during the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria in the past weeks, that the earthquakes or all these disasters are from God's wrath. 
The temporality of how to describe the natural disasters is interpreted with some abstract thoughts. In Aleppo, for example, in the past weeks, prayers and liturgies were dedicated to ask for the mercy of God to stop the earthquake and to end the long sufferings of the people. Thinking about the educational system in the late antiquity and medieval times, some advanced schools should be considered while searching for the influence of the liturgical commentaries in the intellectual circles. Schools played an important role in composing such texts, such as the school of Kenishri or the monastery of John Baraftonia at the east bank of the Euphrates River, where Jacob of Edessa and his friend George of the Arabs had studied together. Both Jacob and George have written commentaries on the liturgy. George of the Arabs, in fact, composed a metrical liturgical commentary which might suggest that it was chanted in the church as an excellent practical pedagogic tool to learn about the liturgy. His attempt was similar to the poetic method of the early Syriac fathers, such as Ephraim the Syrian and Jacob of Serur. In medieval times, we are lucky to read in Bar Hebraeus Nomo Canon some helpful details about how the curriculum of studies in the Syriac intellectual schools should have looked. Although the curriculum included very rich biblical and patristic readings to be covered in the courses of two years, nevertheless, we see only two liturgical commentaries to be studied, one by Moses Bar Kifa in the ninth century and one by Bar Salibi in the 12th century in the required list. This is very interesting, even those days, that the more focus was on the biblical studies than uh, the liturgical commentaries. This might point to how those graduates of those advanced schools were influenced by the two liturgical commentaries which became the most circulated text in the church communities afterwards. We should keep in mind there were also primary schools in the villages where people could learn basic readings, especially from the book of Psalms which should be memorized and reading the Bible. These simple schools were generally led by priests and monks who graduated from those advanced schools, such as Kenishri. It should be noted also here, and this point could be important for ISM, that in the curriculum, hymns and chanting were given a specific importance in the schools. Those students who were not capable of reading, reciting, singing, and chanting beautifully did not participate in the public church services. This remarkable note reminds us of one of the canons written by Jacob of Edessa, which echoes some of Kenishrin school's canons, who even prohibited those with a low quality of voice to sing, especially during the festal celebrations. But in addition to the texts of the liturgical commentaries, canons, stories, and historical texts, there are also other means that have been interpreting the Syriac liturgy while targeting a wide audience such as the sacred art. Dura Europos shows us how the liturgical space has been interacting with the first prayerful Christian communities since the early days in Syria. Lectionaries in the Syriac tradition include many spectacular miniatures, which bear important themes that functioned as interpretation, either biblically or liturgically. The 12th century lectionary from Melitin, which was the manuscript Mardin, 12, and nowadays it's in the Church of 40 Martyrs, 41. This manuscript informs us about the practice of receiving the communion in the hands while taking the consecrated wine and bread separately. We know already, as we saw from the letters of Jacob of Edessa, that communion could be taken to the sick people in cabbage leaves or bread. So it was already possible to hold the communion in the hands of the community laity. 
this manuscript miniature adds another information when the textual liturgical commentaries kept silent about the way of having communion. The icons and other sorts of painting could also play the function of explaining many biblical stories and in addition to some liturgical practices and mysteries. Several icons teach the simple believer that how the water and the blood came out of Jesus' side. So the simple believer also can see it while looking at the curtains in the church as we see here. And we see also the angels collecting the water and the blood inside the chalice. These dramatic portrayals were influenced by certain understandings of the Eucharist and the other liturgical sacraments and at the same time functioned as effective pedagogic tools by teaching all the believers, both the elites and the simple ones, about the meaning of the liturgy. If we go back to the example of these angels holding the chalice next to the crucified Jesus, they are also depicted as we see in certain manuscript and at the church curtains in the Syriac church tradition. Now let's try to have a look at the third factor, which is the Syri with sacred music. The famous Latin saying, lex credendi, lex orandi, on one hand is very important to understand the theology in the liturgical practices of the Syriac tradition. But on the other hand, the liturgical hymns may interpret the liturgy itself as a self-explanatory tool, faithful, in the Syriac church would recite and chant several prayers from the books of the daily office and the office of the hours, which explain the meaning of the liturgy. In fact, according to the book of common prayers or the ordinary daily office known in Syriac as the book of Shehimo, which literally translated as the simple, we have hymns to teach the prayerful community about the symbolic meaning of the Eucharist. For example, in the prayers of the ninth hour of Sunday, the following hymn is a prayed to emphasize on the mystery of the Eucharist. Qurbone qarebon li omro nafsho lo ith edem mawthar li akh pagred morio lo mawthar li bekh yoten hotho as we read in the translation, my soul said, they offered to me offerings, qurbone, as there is nothing that will benefit me like the body of the Lord. Crying and groaning do not benefit me like the body of Christ, which is benefiting me. Likewise, we read in the book of the festal office, Fenkitho, also several prayers which could function as short commentaries on the liturgy, especially on the Eucharist. For example, in the Texo, or the rite of the church renewal, Texo Thudot Eto, we read the following hymn prayer, which is the same hymn also used for the baptismal rite in the Syriac tradition, about three major mysteries in the church which are baptism, communion, or the Eucharist, and the priesthood. Hallelujah <laughs> Three holy mysteries have been granted by our Lord to the church, redeemed by his cross. Baptism, the Eucharist, and the honorable priest who makes the atonement for the sins of his flock. Hallelujah and entreats for mercy. These prayers, in fact, by interpreting the liturgy, contributed in standardizing the meaning of the liturgy in the community while praying. On another note, the liturgical prayers are expressing theological and Christological formula 
and are extremely important even in the recent ecumenical dialogues between the Syriac churches with the Roman Catholic and the Anglican churches. So the prayer, especially in the liturgy of the hours and the weekly offices, while being prayed regularly, are playing a significant role in explaining the liturgy to the community. There are still many unstudied and unedited hymns in the manuscripts, which should be carefully examined to understand better the liturgical practices and the meanings in the Syriac tradition. Now, how about the three factors that we mentioned are combined together? Sacred language, sacred art, and sacred music. Curtains are full of art that can function as commentaries and manuscript icons as well. In summer 2010, I was lucky to meet Khale Nasra Shammas Hindi in the city of Mardin, which is southeast of Turkey nowadays, who passed away in 2016. She belonged to a family with a famous authentic Syriac tradition of painting in a unique method on curtains or in Syriac sutore and other kind of various fabrics, which were used mostly for decorating Syriac churches and homes all over the world. She used to sing some Syriac and Arabic hymns while she was painting the liturgical textiles. I think this is a good example of how the two factors of the sacred art and the sacred music mixed with the first one of sacred language have been working in harmony together by a woman. The production of the Nasra family in Mardin has been influential in the diaspora where many of their painted materials were produced to be used in newly established churches. This kind of art and music is characterized by its simplicity, which have targeted simple believers who are the majority of the church community. Allow me to share with you one minute and a half about what Khali Nasra used to pray by singing hymns and painting. Today we live in a different world and a new commentary needs to be in dialogue with other traditions and other components as well. But perhaps learning from the classical liturgical commentaries may give us also some lessons about the reasons of why some liturgical commentaries continued and then what stopped being circulated, then forgotten, and then therefore didn't get influential. Perhaps the key is be simple, but not be simpler. Let it be allegorical or typological commentary. The most important thing is trying to reach the symbolic message with simplicity. Moreover, the commentaries of the sacred art and the sacred music played a pedagogic role in teaching the prayerful Syria community in different times and places, while the textual commentaries targeted the intellectuals and the priests of the ecclesiastical class of the church communities 
The painting and hymns could help the simple believers to understand several interpretations of the liturgy. But do these explanations, either textually or as found in the pieces of art or as being sung and chanted in the liturgy, make the reasons for those who come to the church prayers regularly stronger? Perhaps not really. Because as Hannah expressed it clearly to me in the story I mentioned at the beginning of our lecture, she said, Dad, I go to the church and attend the liturgy because I love it. I think she is right. In fact, Hannah's innocent answer of linking love with her remarkable interest in going to the church and participating in the liturgy is not far from what St. Ephraim had presented that the, that the luminous eye is necessary to see the meaning of the spiritual world of symbols, the world of rosy. St. Ephraim says, truth and love are wings that cannot be separated. For the truth without love is unable to fly. So too, love without the truth is unable to soar up. Their yoke is one of harmony. So let us train ourselves of how to use symbolism or other kinds of pedagogic tools to explain the mystery of liturgy to everybody who is participating in the liturgical event. We should remember here Taft's famous words, all liturgy is local. And we shall, of course, as liturgists understand and teach ourselves how to explain liturgy according to the specificity of the time and the place. Constructing such a liturgical training needs lots of knowledge and creativity to reach a station where the prayerful community can sit at the table fellowship with Christ while listening to the singing of the sacred music in its eschatological function. I believe ISM is a perfect place to construct such a train. Thank you all. Thank you for such a fascinating and wonderful and inspiring presentation, Ephraim. We have a few minutes uh, for questions. If there are any, and I think Dr. Graves has a mic, if you want to pose a question so that those who are joining us online can also hear the question. I have a million, but I'm happy to just be the ruthless timekeeper. Um, so any questions from the audience? Then I get to, I'm not going to wait any longer. Ah, bad. Uh, use the <laughs> mic. Oh, thank you. Uh, as all of us know, uh, most great Christian traditions have liturgical commentaries. The West has the Latin West. The Byzantine Greek tradition has important commentaries. And you have shown us a marvelous example of the Syriac patrimony. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Now, if you compare that we live in a Western culture, in a Western context. If you take the Western commentaries and you take the Byzantine commentaries, what does the Syriac liturgical commentaries make stand out? Can you say that very yeah. briefly? I would say simplicity. I mean, this is, uh, as they say in German, einfach, you know, that uh, it's, 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 it's the simplest. I think this is most of the common phenomena for these uh, 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 mystagogical, if you want to call it, or this uh, kind of uh, commentary, especially with Bar Kifa and Bar Salibi. Sometimes, you know, that there is no logical way to link between things. For example, why do we celebrate the liturgy and the Eucharist on a wooden table? And then the uh, commentaries would say, well, let's remember that the first sin entered the world because of the tree, so the tree of life. 
And then uh, he keeps going through different kind of symbols. Sometimes there is no direct connection. He goes from that tree to the tree where, where Isaac, during the sacrifice, was, uh, was, was attached to it. And then um, he, he keeps going through different kind of series of uh, events, either typological. And then he would say, and also we don't forget the, the Noah, uh, you know, the Ark of Noah. And then that's why we uh, <laughs> celebrate it on the Eucharist. So there is no logical way, but what I could say is the contemplation. You sit, and, and that's why that I have focused on the inner eye. So I tried to link between the, the concept of St. Ephraim the Syrian, that you should have the inner eye of faith. If you have no faith, and also we find it also with Felixinos of Mabog, so one of the famous Miaphysite theologians, as you know, um, uh, during uh, the 5th, 6th uh, century, you know that uh, is, is the faith. If there is no faith, it's all meaningless. You, know, you cannot even see that this bread and wine are becoming uh, body and blood. So I think it's the simplicity and uh, the faith and the inner eye uh, uh, or the luminous eye as uh, Malfono Rabo, uh, Sebastian Brock uh, would describe it. Okay, that has to be the last question then. Thank you. Uh, my question related with uh, your statement while you mentioning there is uh, painting, interpreting the liturgy. So my question is, is there also a sacred interplay between painting, song, and divine uh, visual philosophy? Is there also a sacred interplay like in Bali between the painting as a form, as a shape, and the song mm -hmm. as the representation of the narration and visual philosophy, sacred interplay. Is that? Is there? Thank you. Of course, the whole occasion is sacred. You know that uh, it, it's, it's not a magic that you know the priest is doing. Of course, that sometimes you have misunderstanding to the Eucharist. So as if it is the magic power of, uh, of the priest who would abracadabra will make it uh, something else. So the whole action are working together. So it is that singing the hymns. It's also watching and living inside the, the whole experience, smelling also the incense. And of course, all is based on faith. Otherwise, uh, these are uh, uh, meaningless. So um, of course, you have to experience all of them. And that's also uh, because one of the question in the Eucharist, as we have here, the great scholar, Professor Brian Spinks, you know, there is always the question, when is the exact moment to change the bread and wine to the body and blood? There is no exact moment. And I think that thinking in this way, whether you know the Latin West would say it's the uh, uh, the institution narrative which transform it, or those who would say it's the invocation of the Holy Spirit. But I think that in general, and I could be corrected, that it's the whole occasion, you know, that once you start the whole experience, you live with this eschatological experience. And as I try to uh, uh, express it in my conclusion, you know, that living in the liturgical experience, looking for the eschaton, for the future, and, uh, and experiencing it in the present time, that will create uh, this uh, sacred uh, setting uh, or atmosphere. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, being with us. Just one last note. Uh, Ephraim Ishak is with us for the remainder of the semester, and he will be back for the ISM Liturgy Conference in June and present a paper there. So come back for the conference um, to learn more. Thank you. <laughs>